Seches Mal Kat on Daf Chafay continues the halachas of Avelos. The beginning of the Daf will discuss when someone should tear Kriya or keep any other halachas of mourning for someone who is not a relative. The Gemara will then go into a list of stories about things that happened when Talmud Chachamim passed away from the world, and it also lists some eulogies, some hespedim that were given when Talmud Chachamim passed from the world. It'll be a lengthy daf discussing a number of Samir Chachamim, when they died, and the incidents that happened. So the Gemara begins, it's commenting on the Mishnah, which we just ended. The Mishnah says that one only needs to keep the halachas of Avelos for his relative, for one of his close relatives. The Gemara asks, a price that says that one should tear Kriya for a Chacham, for any wise man. Now the text of the Bryce says as follows, when a wise man, when a Chacham has died, everyone is his relative. So Mar says it can't mean that everyone is really his relatives, because it doesn't make you a relative. It means everyone should have the halacha of his relative, which means everyone has to tear kriya, everyone has to bear the shoulder, and everyone has to have a sudas havra'ah, that's the meal that's served to mourners. So you see, everyone becomes a mourner when it's a chacham that died. So Mar says, okay, here we're talking about someone who's not a chacham. So Gemara says, okay, but even if he's just an Adam Kasher, even if he's just a good, upright, upstanding individual, everyone's supposed to tear Kriya for him. Gemara quotes a Brisa that says, everyone, uh, the Brisa says, why does one lose his children? Why does one's sons and daughters die as children? It's in order to inspire him to cry and mourn for the loss of an Adam Kasher, for the loss of a proper individual. Someone says, hold on a second. You mean to say that a person will have his kids die even though he did nothing wrong just in order that he should cry in the future for a Adam Kasher? Someone says, no, it can't be what it means. It means that the reason why someone will lose his children is because he's punished because he did not properly mourn over the loss of an Adam Kasher, over the loss of a good person. Someone says, so the Mishnah then, which says that only one's relatives should mourn, is when we're not talking about an Adam Kasher, was not a good, was not an upstanding individual. So I think Mara says, there's another circumstance in which one needs to mourn, even if it's not an Adam Kasher, and that's if someone's present at the time that the soul departs. Mara quotes a Bryce, Shem ben says, anyone who's in the room at the time of Yitzhi's Neshama, the time of the departing on the soul, has to tear Kriya, because it's like a Sefer Torah that was burned. The body is like the Sefer Torah, the body is has lost the soul, that it's like a Sefer Torah that has been destroyed, and one needs to tear Kriya, even if it's not an Adam Kasher. So Gemara says, another, uh, so here we have an incident, this is the beginning of our list of stories, and where it says, when Rav Safar died, the Rabban did not tear Kriya. They said, we didn't learn anything from him, so why should we tear Kriya for him? So Abai said, first of all, it doesn't say that when one's Rebbe dies, he needs to go into mourning, it says when a Chacham dies, that refers to anyone. Second of all, we do learn from him. We say over his teachings all the time. We may not be his Talmudim, but we quote his teachings in the base Medrash, and that's us learning from him. So they accepted what he said, and they thought, though, what it's too late. The time for a tear in Kriya has passed. So he said, no, as long as the spadim are going on, you can still tear Kriya. So they want to tear Kriya right then on the spot. And I said, no, it has to be during the Hespid, during the eulogy. You have to wait until the next Hespid begins, and then you can tear Kriya at that time. And now the Gemara quotes a lengthy incident that happened at the time of the passing of Rav Huna. So Gemara says, when Rav Huda died, they wanted to put a Sefer Torah on the beer, on the, the bed on which he was lying. And Rav Chizda said, he was so careful never to sit on the same surface as a Sefer Torah. How could you do that to him, to have him be lying on a surface with a Sefer Torah after he died? What was that incident? Because Rav Tachlifa said, I saw that Rav Huda wanted to sit on his the bed, on his bed, but there was a Sefer Torah lying on it, so he took the Torah off and he put it on a jug that he overturned on the ground, meaning he made a stand in order to put the Torah on there so that he would not be sitting on the same surface. So you see that he felt that it was forbidden to sit on the surface, the same surface that held a Sefer Torah. Okay, so therefore they didn't put the Sefer Torah on his bed, on the beer, they wanted to carry him out of the room, out of the building, but the, the bed didn't fit through the doorway. So they wanted to try to lower it through the roof. They had an opening up to the roof. They wanted to lower it by. They wanted to carry it up to the roof and then lower it to the ground outside by means of ropes. And Rav Chizda said you can't do that because we know that the halacha is that it's proper covered for a chacham to have him go out through the door, not through any other way. So I said, okay, but the bed doesn't fit, so they want to transfer him to a different bed. And Rav Chizda said, no, you're not allowed to transfer him to a different bed. The covered of a chacham is that he should be removed only on the original bed in which he was laid. The source for that is from the Pasuk discussing when the Aron was returned to Kal Yisrael by the Pelishtim. It says, Ve'yikivus Aron al-Hagola al 
Agola Chadasha, on a new wagon. New wagon is mentioned previously, and it refers to a special wagon that was made by the Polishtim to carry the Aron. So you see that they used the same wagon that they had before, they didn't switch it to a different wagon. Just like the Aron was carried in the same wagon, a Chacham should be carried in the same bed, should not be transferred to a different bed. So there was nothing else to do, they broke the doorway, widened it, and let him through. Okay, now, Rabbi... Abba began to say a eulogy. He said that our Rebbe, Rav uh, Huna, was befitting that he should have Ashras Ashkina, the Shekhinah should rest on him, and meaning he should have Nevuah, but he wasn't able to do it because he lives in the Chutzar, he lives in Vavel, which is outside of Eretz Yisrael. So at that point, Rav Nachman Bar Chizda, or some say it was Chanan Bar Chizda, but it was definitely a son of Rav Chizda, asked, but Yechezkel Navi said Nevuah outside Eretz Yisrael, like it says, Hayoy Hayo, Dvar Hashem Ali Chesko, Ben Buzi Akoin Be'eretz Kastim. Yechezka ben Buzi, the Kohen, got word of Hashem to him in Eretz Kasdim. That is none other than Vavel, same place. So if he was able to get Nevua in Bavel, so should Rav Huna. So he said his father, Rav Chizda, tapped him with his shoe in order to get his attention. He said, I told you, stop asking questions that bother people. It says, Hoyoi Hoyo. That means he was already receiving Nevua before. Someone who started receiving Nevua earlier can continue receiving Nevua even if he leaves Eretz Yisrael. He already has Ashar Sushchin and the connections are already established. But Rav Huna was born in Chotzaretz and therefore he could not. Okay, so Rav Huna's beer arrived in Eretz Yisrael and Ravami and Ravasi were the leading to me to come him there and they were told that Rav Huna has arrived. They did not, we were not told that his coffin arrived. They just thought he arrived while he was still alive. So they were upset about it because they said when we were in Rava, we weren't able to lift our heads because of the kavod of Rav Huna there. He was the leading sage, and we could not speak. Now here he came after us, and they felt that this was inappropriate because they were the uh, Talmud Chachamim here in Eretz Yisrael, and they, they didn't feel that it would be okay for him to come when it was their jurisdiction. So they were told, it was explained to them, no, Aronoba, his Aron, his, car, his coffin has come, he's not amongst the living. So Rav Ami Rav Asi went out to greet, to meet the beer, the coffin. Rav Ila, two different versions, whether he went or he didn't go, and Rav Hanina did not go. So Gemara asks, why did some of them go and some of them not go? So Gemara says, those who went, because they have a bracelet that says, when a Aron comes from somewhere else, you, there should be the Shura, the two rows to uh, console the mourners should be performed, and you say berchaz avelim, and one should also do tanchumi avelim, so all the practices of avelis occur when an aron arrives from somewhere else. That's why some of them went out, and there's a different mind that says the opposite, it says when an aron arrives from somewhere else, there is no shura, there is no berchaz avelim, and there is no nichum avelim. So that's why Rav Chanina and possibly Rav Ila did not go out to greet the of uh, the Aron of Rav Huna. So Gemara says, well, hold on a second, these prices contradict each other? Versus the answer is, is that one's referring to when the body is still intact, the other's referring to where the body has decomposed already to the extent that the spine is not intact anymore. So Gemara says, but here Rav Huna, is, he was intact, he had come right away, he wasn't held in storage for a while. So Gemara says, why then did Rav Hanina and possibly Rav Yilah not go out to greet them? So Gemara says, they weren't told that he was intact, they were under the understanding that he was not intact, and therefore they did not go out to greet them. Okay, then the Chachamim wanted to decide where to bury him. He would need to be put next to a Talmud Chacham of equal or similar stature. So Gemara says, they said they decided that it was befitting to bury him near Rav Chia. Both Rav Huna was Marbit's Torah, he taught a lot of Talmidim, and Rav Chia was also Marbit's Torah, uh, Rashi quotes at Rav Huna, it says that he had so many and when he stood up there was a cloud of d- 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 dust that was very large formed by all his Tamidim who stood up and by Rav Chia, it says that he had said that I'm restoring Torah to Kal Yisrael with his many Tamidim. So they said Chamim said the two of them should be buried together Now Rav Chia already had a crypt that's, he had a, a large room in the cemetery in which his grave and the grave of his sons were. So they were going to bring Rav Huna in there to bury him next to him. The problem was they were afraid to go in there. There were incidents recorded in Shas where people had bad things happen to them because they went into Rav Chia's crypt. So Gemara says they asked around who was willing to go, and Rav Chaga said, I'll go. I was one of his Talmidim. I was 18 years old when I understood most of my learning, when I knew Shas. I never saw a seminal emission. I know about Rav Chia, I know about his maizim, his actions, and his mitzvahs. For example, I know that one time he put on tefillin and his ritzua was upside down, the white part was showing, not the black part, and he sat and he fasted 40 fast days because of that. 
So therefore, I'm the one who's willing to go. So he brought Rav Huna in, and over there he observed that Rav Chia's two sons, Yehuda and Chizkiah, were lying on either side of him. All three of them, of course, were were buried and dead. But the Gemara says, and this might be a mashal, or it could be understood allegorically, Yehuda said to Chizkiah, get up, you have to stand up. Rav Huna's here, it's not covered for you to lie down while Rav Huna is here. So Chizkiah stood up, and as he stood up, a large pillar of flame came out with him. And Rav Chaga, who had brought in Rav Huna, was uh, frightened, and he blocked the pillar of a flame from him with the coffin of Rav Huna. He put Rav Huna in front of him and he ran out. So he says he escaped punishment from that activity because he blocked the flame with the Aaron of Rav Huna. Otherwise he would have been in serious trouble. Okay, now the Gemara goes on to what happened when Rav Chizda died. So the Gemara says they wanted to put a Sefer Torah on the bed and Rav Yitzchak said something which he was so careful about we can't do it to him. Rav Chizda was the one who, pro- who protested against putting the Sefer Torah on the bed of Rav Huna. So they did not put a uh, Sefer Torah on his bed. Now they tore Kriya, and they were trying to decide uh, whether they should sew up the tear of the Kriya or not. So Rav Yitzchak Ami said that the Halacha is at a Chacham, which would tear Kriya for him as soon as the mourners who tore Kriya leave the mace, they are allowed to patch the tear. can't do it with proper stitches. It has to be with uneven stitches, which we've seen before, are used under certain circumstances. All right, now the Gemara speaks about what happened when Rabba Bar Rav Huna and Rav Hamnuna, when they died. So they were transported to Eretz Yisrael. The Gemara says, while they were being transported, they reached a narrow bridge, and they cannot both go across them at once. The entire way up till then, they walked together, neither of them in front of the other. But here, one of them had to go first. So the camels that were standing them stood still. They refused to uh, go any further because either, each one wanted to show honor to the other one that he should go first. So the Gemara says was an Arab merchant there and he stopped them and he said, what's going on? Why did you stop? They said, there's two Chachamim here. They're honoring each other. Each one is saying to the other one, you go first. So the Arab said, uh, I think Rabbi Barahuna should go first because he, he is the son of Etam Chacham while Rav Hamnuna was not. So Gemara says that that's what they did. Rabbi Rav Huna went first, but that Arab was punished for speaking inappropriately about Rav Hamnuna, and his teeth fell out. And now the Gemara discusses the Hespedim that were said. The Gemara says it was a young man who said Hesped over Rav Huna, and he said the following thing, The descendant of Tamir Chachamim has uh, come from Bavel, the Imei Sefer Muhammad and together with him, the Book of Wars, Muhammad Hashem, is used in Chumash to refer to the Torah. Ka'av Kipod Hochbalu, that's Kas and Kipod, those are two birds who live in the desert, who wail, who wail and scream a lot, so they are combined to cry over their loss. And they are seeing Bishod Vishever Habal Mishinar, the Shod Vision, Shever, that's an expression from Michesko or from Yeshaya, to see the destruction and, and disaster that has come from Shinar, from Bavel. Shem became angry at the world, and therefore he grabbed away two Neshamos, but he is happy with them, as if he has a new Kala. They are together with him. And the one who rides the top high heavens, Rochiv Aravos, is Sosvesamach, is happy when clear and clean in souls come to him. Now, another example of a eulogy is when Ravina died. So the Safdona, the eulogizer, said that the tops of the palm trees should wave in pain and in mourning over the Tzadik Katamar, over the Tzadik who was as a palm tree, as we say, Tzadik Katamar Yefrach. Then he said, Let's make our nights like the days, not stopping to cry. For the loss of the Tam Chachim, who made his nights like days, never stopping to learn. Okay, now the Gemara talks about some eulogies that were not appropriate. So the Gemara notes that there were professional eulogizers who used to go around. They were hired to say eulogies. One was named Bar Kipok, and one was named Bar Oven. Where says Rav Ashi asked Bar Kipok, "What eulogy are you going to say for me?" And Bar Kipok said, "I'm going to say like this. I'm going to say." If the tall tree was burned in the fire, so what will the moss of the wall do? And if the big whale was lifted out of the sea with the fish hook, what are the little fish 
who swim in the shallow water is going to do. And if a powerful river just dried up, what's the little pond going to do? Meaning to say that if Rav Ashi, who counts as the tall tree, the whale, and the powerful river, if he was overtaken by death, so then everyone else is certainly going to suffer the same end. Now Bar Avin said to Bar Kipok, you can't say that. You cannot compare a Talmud Chacham cannot mention the word flame, which seems to indicate Gehenim, or fish hook, which is just disrespectful and shows he was grabbed from the world. You cannot say that about a Talmud Chacham. So Bar Kibbuk said to Bar Oven, so what would you say? See, he said, I would say cry for the mourners who lost something, but don't cry for the lost object, for the soul, because it has peace in Gan Eden, and we are moaning because we lost a Talmud Chacham. Umar says the Ravashi was upset about both of these. There's different versions in the Mepharshim. Either he was upset that they had a eulogy so ready to go for him, it means they were expecting him to die, or he was upset um, because of what they said. He didn't think it was appropriate. Some say it was because that he was referred to as a lost soul. He didn't plan on having his soul be lost. But either way, these eulogizers were punished by their feet becoming twisted, so they couldn't stand. And when Ravashi actually did die, they were not able to eulogize him because they couldn't where it says this is the meaning of what Ravashi had said that Bar Kipok and Bar Oven can't do chalitza because their feet were twisted. Okay, now the Gemara has another story about Bar Oven. Where it says when Rava was trying to cross the Tigris River, which is near where Rava lived, he said to Bar Oven, "Could you say a tefila for me that I should be able to cross?" So Rav Oven, so Bar Oven stood up and said, "Bo Rav Shlishes Bamayim." Most of the third is in the water. Shlishis is a word that refers to Kal Yisrael. Most of the Shlishis refers to the leader, the Tamil Chacham of Kal Yisrael. And then he said, Zachar Varachim, remember and have mercy. We have strayed from you like a wife who strayed from her husband. Don't let the bitter water overtake us. Again, referring to the Sota, who is destroyed by bitter waters. And he was saying, Hashem, please don't let Rava be destroyed by bitter waters. All right, now the Gemara speaks about more eulogies and incidents that happened when Tamid Chamem had died. The Mark gives a simon, who we're going to talk about, Chanan Yochanan, Zera Abba Yaakov, Yosi Shmuel, Chia, Menachem. The Mark says that Rav Chanan was the son-in-law of the Nasi, didn't have any children, and he was Mispal, and he did have a child, but on the day they had a child, he died. So, uh, you just said a tefillah, a eulogy for him. He said that Simcha has been turned to sadness, Joy and sadness became connected, and at the time of his great happiness, he was moaning, and the time the child was given life, the one who was responsible for him was lost. And the says that the baby was named Hanan after his father. Now, when Rav Yochanan died, Rav Yitzchak ben Elazar said the eulogy for him, he said, this day is as bad as the day in which the sun set early, referring to the day where Yeshua HaMelech was killed, where... Uh, Yermio said a Hespid Ba Shemesh Bitsarayim, the sun has set in the middle of the day. So Rav Yitzhak ben Elazar was saying the same, the same thing applies to when Rav Yechanan died. Now, when also when Rav Yechanan died, the Gemara says that Rav Ami did Shiva and Shloshim, and Rav Abba, son of Chibar Abba, said that Rav Ami was acting in his own opinion, but most people hold that one only sits Shiva for one day not Shiva, for a Rebbe. He, shiva is only for a relative. And this applies even, he said, to one who lost the Rebbe from whom he lo- he learned the majority of his Chachma, which is what counts as a Rebbe, Muvok, al Now the Gemara says, when Rav Zera died, Hesped was said for him that Eretz Shinar Harav Yolda, the land of Shinar, which refers to Vavel, gave birth to him. And Eretz Tzvi, which refers to Eretz Yisrael, the land of the deer, raised her, L'Shashua, for delight. And Rekes, which refers to Teveria, is mourning over the precious lost Klichem Dosa, the lost precious instrument. Then it says, when Rav Yabo passed away, the pillars of Kesaria cried, water flowed down. Then when Rav Yaisi passed away, the gutters of Tzipiri flowed with blood, which is where he lived, when Rav Yaakov died. The stars were visible during the day. When Rav Asi died, the trees were all uprooted, maybe by a storm. When Rav Chia died, fiery rocks came out of the sky. When Rav Nacham, the son of Rav Simai, died, all the coins lost their image, they were all flattened. Farshim say he was mocked, but not to look at those because they were Avodah Zara. When Rav Tancham, Rav Chia died, all the 
statues of kings were knocked down. When Rav Yashiv died, 70 break-ins happened in Narada. People stole. Um, his merit had protected them from that. And when Rav Nuna died, hailstones came out of the sky. When Rav and Rav Yosef died, the arches that held up the bridge over the Nahar Prost, the Euphrates, they broke and touched each other. When Abayah and Rava passed away, the arches of the bridges over the Tigris, the Diglas, they died, uh, they broke and touched each other. When Rav died, the palm trees started growing thorns.